All right, I'd like us to turn once again, please, if we could, uh, in our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23, and I'll read the first eight verses, uh, same passage we read last night, and uh, hopefully we'll make some progress in the text. Uh, last night was largely introductional, but it begins this way, uh, look in 23 verse uh, one, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It's the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. In the 14th day of the first month, that even is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. In the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is an holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. And again, God will bless that short reading from his precious word to us today. Now, you should have uh, got one of these charts as well. You may get to refer to that a little bit more today. Uh, but as we consider uh, these feasts, remember we said last night that they're holy days, uh, special uh, times that people had to stop work and come together to meet with God. Uh, and to uh, for specific purposes, we talked about some of the festivals were were to be memorial festivals. They were to remember significant events in their history, like Passover, which was their Independence Day, just like we would celebrate Fourth of July. Okay, so just like a, a memorial of some historical event. Some of them were agricultural festivals, uh, harvest festivals, bringing in the barley harvest and the wheat harvest and the corn and wine harvest. And yet all of them, uh, we learned last night, are also types and shadows of something greater. And we said the first four festivals are fulfilled in the first advent of the Lord Jesus. And what I meant to point out last night, and I didn't, is that the first four festivals kind of end with a clear kind of statement. And, and that is in the end of verse 22, where the first four festivals are dealt with. And then it says this, uh, the very last phrase, I am the Lord your God. So that ends the first four festivals, right? It kind of is, is kind of surrounded by, I am the Lord your God. And then the second group of, four fest uh, of three festivals, they're four and three, the second group of three concludes with the, in verse 43, that your generations may know that I am the, that, that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Again, so that kind of sandwiches the second group of four. So that I am the Lord your God is kind of uh, gives the boundary to them. We said they're in fours and threes. It's amazing, by the way, just as an aside, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but the Bible has a lot of sevens. And they're always, always divided into fours and threes. Always. Four at the first advent, three at the second advent. The seven kingdom parables. The first four are to do with the seed and its products. Remember, a saw went forth the saw. Uh, wheat and the tares. Uh, the, the measure of meal. Uh, all to do with, uh, with the seed and its, and its products. The last three have nothing to do with it. So again, four and three. Uh, seven Church of Revelation, you can divide them into four and three. Uh, we, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, the the uh, Revelation judgments, uh, the seals, trumpets, bowls, you can divide them very clearly into fours and threes. There was, uh, what we see is the stamp of God on the word of God. That when he kind of does something, he does it consistently. 
and, and he does it throughout the whole Bible. And those kind of things are very thrilling. When you study the scripture, you see those kind of things. They're the kind of things that give the Bible student goosebumps. When you see these patterns and you see them repeated over and over and over again in the word of God, you say no human being could ever write a book like this. It really is quite remarkable. Amen. But as we consider uh, the feasts, uh, I want you to notice that uh, it talks about uh, mm -hmm. verse 1 concerning the feasts of the Lord. And, and the idea of these feasts, it, it literally has the idea of to meet by appointment. That's the idea, uh, by appointment of Jehovah himself. Uh, they, they were, uh, he, that's why he calls them the feasts of the Lord. Uh, in other words, he's the host. He is saying, I want you to have a festival. And, and I'm inviting you to come to the festival. And I want your presence at the festival. So he's kind of the initiator of this whole idea. Uh, he also calls them holy convocations. Uh, you'll notice that again in verse 1. Uh, oh, sorry, verse 2. Uh, Speak to the children of Israel, say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. And that phrase, holy convocations, is found 11 times in this chapter. And, and again, it's the idea of a holy gathering, right? We're, we're gathering together at the Lord's invitation to enjoy a festival that he has initiated. And the idea is this, that he wants our fellowship. I mean, that's a remarkable thing to think about, isn't it? That God, God is, I think we don't realize this like we should. God is a relational being. He actually wants a relationship with us he initiates that and you see that right at the very beginning of time you see that the lord god walked with adam in the garden in the cool of the day so you get this idea god says come on let's take a walk together i'd like to spend some time with you i, I like your fellowship isn't that amazing that god would ever want our fellowship mm -hmm. and, and you see that throughout the word of god uh, Enoch walking with God, Ad, uh, Abraham, the friend of God, right? And this idea that God, now he doesn't need it because, because God, because he's triune, there's, there's existing fellowship before man was made, right? Within the Godhead. But he still wants our fellowship. And, and so these festivals, it's all about saying, I want you to come together. I want you to come to meet me. And I want you to come so that we can enjoy a time out of the busyness of life, kind of take some time out and just enjoy communion with me. And that's God. This is our God is a, is a God who wants that. New Testament would tell us, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9, that you and I have been called into the fellowship of his son. Isn't that amazing? His son wants our fellowship. Uh, that's, these are remarkable things. Like, like, doesn't he know who I am? I mean, why would he want anything to do with a person like me? I, I can't figure it out, but he does. He wants our fellowship and has gone to considerable lengths to secure that fellowship. And so he enjoys it. He enjoys being together with his people. The difficulty is that even though he says, these are my feasts, yeah, he owns them. They're, they're, they're the feasts of the Lord, uh, these holy convocations. Uh, they're, they're his, uh, they're special to him. Uh, the problem is that they, uh, if we're not careful, they can, they can become very formal. Anything that God initiates, if we're not careful, we can just go through the motions, can be a routine thing. And so I want you to notice, for instance, these feasts of Jehovah that he talks about here, here in verse 2, concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. And yet I want you to look at what happened by the time we got to the New Testament days, and look at John's Gospel chapter 2, please. John chapter 2, in John chapter 2 and verse 13, these feasts of Jehovah, feasts of the Lord, that he calls my feasts, by the time we get to the New Testament, he says, verse 13, the Jews' Passover was at hand. Notice that. It's not anymore my Passover or the Lord's Passover. It's the Jews' 
Passover. In other words, he's no, not part of it anymore, right? Uh, look at chapter 5 of John and verse 1. Now, th after this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Chapter 7 of John and verse 2. Chapter 7, verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. So what's happened between Leviticus 23 and the Gospel of John? All of a sudden, they're no longer my feasts. They're no longer the feasts of the Lord. They're the Jews' feasts. Something's changed. Let's look at something else. Look at Isaiah, please. Isaiah chapter 1. Prophecy of Isaiah chapter 1. Read a shocking statement, a statement that ought to shock us at least. Isaiah's prophecy, the first chapter, verse 14. Isaiah 1, verse 14, where God says this He says, Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary. To bear them. Isn't that terrible? Mm -hmm. These feasts that, that he initiated, he says, I want your fellowship. Uh, I want you to take these times out of your busy life to come together uh, to, to meet with me. And uh, they were his feasts. He owned them, the, the feasts of the Lord. And yet, Isaiah, by the time we come to Isaiah's time, he says, uh, I, I loathe them. Uh, so, what had happened? How, how had Jehovah's joy in meeting with his people become lost? And I want to suggest to you it had become lost because people had basically, what we might say, dead formalism had set in. And they were just going through the motions. It was kind of like business as usual. We have these feasts. These are our holidays. Uh, we come together and we say the right words. We go through the right ceremonies, but our heart is not there. And the Lord will say that to them. You draw near to me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Right? And so it just became a sham. It was just going through the motions. It was just an act. And the danger is that, that we have a feast, an appointed feast in the New Testament. On the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. And it should be a, a precious time. It's the, the Lord is the one who appointed the, fe the feast, right? He said, do this in remembrance of me. Uh, it's something that he wanted. He, he delights in communion with his people. He, he's called us into that fellowship. And yet I wonder how many times is it a wearisomeness to him? Because we have lost the wonder of it all, and we're just going through the motions. And it's just a dead formal ritualism. And some people, they're, they're tired of the Lord's Supper because that's what they see it as. Tired, repeated old phrases from people who have lost their real joy in the Lord. And they're just going through the motions. And so there's a real danger with this, this, these festivals, that formality and uh, uh, just routine takes over from genuine devotion and genuine love expressed to the law. And we need to, what can change that is us individually, right? We'll never rise above the individual. How are we doing? in terms of our love relationship with the Lord. Because when we come together corporately, it's really an overthrow, an overflow, and an expression of our individual walks with the Lord. And so if I'm excited about the Lord, if I'm excited about his work and what and his son and what he has done, then when we come together, uh, if we're all like that, it's, it's not going to be a dead formal ritual. It's going to be an overflowing of hearts that are madly in love with the Lord Jesus. Mm. And it's going to be wonderful. And so the only thing that can affect that is your personal relationship with the Lord. And I really believe that. The, the thermometer of an assembly, I believe, is the spiritual thermometer is the Lord's Supper. It really is. And it, it reveals the heart. And you see, if you're in a megachurch, 
you can make it look good whether your hearts are right or not. <laughs> but our meetings, we can't do that. If we're not really where we ought to be, it will be obvious within minutes. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Can't wait till tomorrow morning. It's going to be really interesting. <laughs> I'll be able to test the temperature of the assembly <laughs> here spiritually tomorrow morning. No pressure, but but this is <laughs> this is the bottom line. You can test the temperature very easily. And again, it, it really is an individual thing. How are you doing? How's your spiritual temperature? Um, just to go back to Leviticus 6 for a moment. A verse that I, a brother shared with me the other day, and it really was a great joy to my heart to think about this. Concerning the offerings, and it says this in verse 13, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. In other words, in order for these Levitical offerings to be offered, there had to be an altar, and the altar had to have a fire on it, and the fire had to be constantly kept going. Because you can't offer an offering, because it because these offerings were were ascending offerings, you see. They were they were burned, and there was there was an aroma that ascended to the presence of God. But if you have no fire, then there'll be no aroma ascending. And the brother simply said this. How is the fire on the altar of your heart? Because when you come to the Lord's Supper, if that fire is, is kind of burning low and dimly, there won't be much aroma that will ascend. But if there's a good fire burning in the altar of your heart, there'll be a beautiful aroma that will ascend to the presence of God. And so can I ask you that question this morning? It's a good question to really begin our day with, really, isn't it? How is the spiritual fire on your heart? Are you in fire of devotion for the Lord burning brightly? Or, or is, it, is the, are the flames flickering just a little bit? We need to examine ourselves, right? How is your devotion to the Savior? How is the fire in your heart towards the Lord? So... <clears throat> As we just a kind of a warning about these festivals that, that in a sense that it is possible something so beautiful Lord one in these times can become uh, a dead ritual a formalism uh, can become very empty. On our chart you'll notice that uh, they actually begin with a Sabbath and they end with a Sabbath and we'll see this in the passage as well. Uh, so these seven festivals are sandwiched between two Sabbaths. I want to just kind of think about that for a moment. Uh, so uh, just notice, for instance, in chapter 23 and verses 1 through 3, before he starts speaking about the specific festivals, the first thing he talks about is the Sabbath. And so it says, we'll just read it again. The Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which... You shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It's the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. And so before he starts talking about the Passover and unleavened bread and all these other festivals, he begins with the Sabbath. How does he end? Let's look at Leviticus 23. Again, and look at verse 39. It says, And the fifth, also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Now, this is the Feast of Tabernacles, because the next verse says, You should take on the first day, the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, uh, boughs of thick trees, willows of the brook. You'll rejoice before the Lord you God seven days. So it's the Feast of Tabernacles. But I want you to notice that it ends with an eighth day. It's a seventh day festival. And then at the end of it, there's an eighth day. And that eighth day, it says, shall be a Sabbath. So these two festivals, or these, these seven festivals, are sandwiched between two Sabbaths. There's a first Sabbath, there's a second Sabbath. I want to suggest to you that at least as a way of type, the first Sabbath represents creation rest, right? So at the end of 
God speaking the world into existence in six, let me just say this, 24 hour days, right? I, I am absolutely convinced from the text of scripture that creation occurred in six 24 hour days. Amen. And on the seventh day, God rested. He ceased from his labor because it was done. The creation was finished. But the tragedy is that, of course, everything God created, he says it was good. It was very good, right? So all, this creation was unspoiled. It was pristine. It was beautiful in, in, in a way that's hard for us to imagine. As beautiful as our creation is, it's marred by sin. But this was, was unmarred. It was perfect. It was very good. Everything was perfect. But then what happened was sin came in and ruined God's creation. And we're, the earth we're in now, that's filled with things like viruses <laughs> and all kinds of diseases and sickness is because we're living in a fallen creation. Okay. And so what we find now is that God's rest is being disturbed. He can't rest now because how can he rest when his creation is so groaning and travailing and, and in such a mess because of man's sin? And so, again, we have to go to John's gospel and notice a statement in John's gospel about what happens once God's creation rest has been destroyed by sin. You see in John 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them. This is concerning the Lord Jesus healing somebody on a Sabbath day. Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto and I work. And here's the point. What it's saying is, how can divine persons, the father and the son, rest when the world is so ravaged by the effects of sin? And so he says, we're working again now. Yeah, I rested uh, on the seventh day from all my labor in creating the world because it was perfect. But now it isn't. Sin has come in. The creation has come crashing down because the head of creation has fallen. And so as a result of that, as a result of the fall, it says my father's working and I'm working. And it's not till we get to the eighth day in, in this passage, Leviticus 23, verse 39, after the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles, we're going to see, is a type of the Millennial Kingdom. Okay, And at the end of the Millennial Kingdom, Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. All sinners will be judged and thrown into the lake of fire, too, that have not been saved. And we go into the eternal rest which will never, ever be disturbed. And in between creation rest and eternal rest are these seven festivals that really show the plan of redemption from Christ becoming our Passover to Christ reigning as king over the earth for a thousand years, right? And so we've got the whole plan of redemption in these festivals it, that are, as it were, sandwiched in between these two Sabbaths. So now we want to talk about the, the feast of the Passover, the first of the festivals. Having kind of given the framework, uh, we, we want to think about the Passover. Now, it is interesting that the Passover uh, should have been kept annually throughout the history of Israel. But there were, there were long time frames where it was neglected and it wasn't kept at all. They, they failed to keep the Passover. And it's interesting that when you study the revivals in Israel's history under godly kings like Hezekiah and, and like um, Job, let me get it right. Come on, help me out here. Hezekiah and Josiah. Josiah, right? Along with that revival, you always have a restoration of the Passover. In other words, revival 
in a, rest, a restored Passover always go hand in hand. When they neglected it, things went wrong. When things were right, it was restored to its former place. And the idea is this, that all blessing is based on the death of Christ and our appreciation of it. All blessing is based on the death of Christ and our appreciation of it. It's the foundation of everything that brings glory to God and blessing to man is found at the cross. It's right there. All the foundation of blessing, a glory to God, blessing to man is found in the place of the cross. If we're wrong on that, we're wrong on everything. I was telling uh, someone recently, we we're talking about training young men. And one of the things I said was that in Ireland, one of the things that they have is a, a, a simple idea is this, that they would, if they, uh, a young man would never be allowed to preach until he proved himself in the gospel. In other words, he'd start with the gospel, right? If you're going to let him speak, you know, you give him, say, have two preachers preach the gospel on a Sunday night, and one takes a small 15 minute, the younger guy, and then the older guy takes 30 minutes. But the idea is this, that their thinking is this, if a person is not right on the gospel, he's not right, period. Amen. So, so we're going to blood somebody, don't give them the epistle to the Ephesians to teach on, right? Start them with the gospel. Let's see they're right on that. Then after that, you can let them loose on Ephesians. But you start them with the most important thing, because the foundation of all our blessings is there at the cross. And so we got to get that right. So this feast of Passover, and again, we read it in verse um, four. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. In the 14th day of the first month of even is the Lord's Passover. So this is the festival we're thinking about, the Lord's Passover. And of course, the idea of Passover uh, has the idea of to to either pass over or to hover over, okay? As a both ideas, pass over or hover over. We'll explain it more fully in a moment. But a very important word, it's used 49 times in the Old Testament. And so quite significant, uh, because that's seven times seven, right? Uh, so it means it's pretty perfect. The Passover is a perfect picture of the personal work of the Lord Jesus, found 49 times. It's found in nine Old Testament books, and uh, it's very, very significant. Uh, it, it shows perfect rest and sufficiency to be found in the Lamb. And so I want to just, for a moment, keep your finger in Leviticus 23. I'd like us to just look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians 5, where we, we want to look at our New Testament warrant for seeing this Old Testament event as a clear picture of the Lord Jesus. Remember we said these were types of the Lord Jesus. They were pictures of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, he says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So right there in these two verses, you've got two festivals mentioned, Passover and unleavened bread, right? Quite clearly in these two verses. Now, here's the interesting thing. Who comprised the assembly in Corinth? What was the makeup of the assembly? Now, we know from Acts 18, it started in a synagogue. But when you go to 1 Corinthians 12, notice verse 2. He says, you know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. And so what we could say is that although the assembly began in a synagogue, because Paul always went to the Jew first. And so the early converts were Jews. But the vast majority of the converts were Gentiles, people saved out of paganism and idolatry. And yet he writes to them and assumes that they understand the teaching of the Passover and unleavened bread. Right? Because that makes no sense to you unless you know about Leviticus 23. 
Like, why would I want to be a new lump? I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, uh, <laughs> purge out the old leaven that you might be a new lump. I mean, that makes no sense unless you have the background in Leviticus 23. And so here's the, my point. It's a simple point, and that is this. That it's impossible to understand your New Testament, including the epistles, without a foundation in the Old Testament. Because Paul is assuming his readers know about the Passover and know about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He's assuming that. And how would he know that? Well, because he spent 18 months in Corinth. And, and I'm sure that at least one of the weekend series was probably on the Feast of Jehovah. Right? So that's why we say we need Old Testament teaching because you, I'm sorry, no matter how smart you are, you cannot understand your New Testament without a foundation in the Old Testament. Because these verses make no sense without that knowledge. Right? That's why we need to have weekends on the feast. Uh, when, when, if you ever have a series on the offerings, you're going to see how many references there are in the epistles to the Levitical offerings everywhere. It's incredible. We have a brother in our assembly, Shannon Bollinger, wonderful, gifted brother. And he loves the offerings. And wherever he's preaching, he always goes back to the offerings, no matter where it is. And, he, and he's not wrong in doing that because he sees it everywhere. And he's right to see it everywhere. It's amazing. Uh, so we just want to see this is why it's important to have this Old Testament foundation. And so these Corinthian believers, he's, he tells us, even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. This Old Testament type, this Old Testament picture of the Passover lamb is really a picture of Christ, who is our Passover. Okay, so we want to kind of take that framework now. And we want to look at the first Passover for a moment. So I'd like us to go back to Exodus and chapter 12. And we want to just kind of work through this. Is, I know you know this. This is familiar uh, to all of us. Uh, but it's, it's good to review it. I think this is very heartwarming to go through this. It really thrills my soul to go through this. In fact, you know, the interesting thing is, the longer I live as a Christian, the more I enjoy the simple truths of the gospel more and more. I'd love to just hear the gospel. It thrills my soul more and more. I, I, no, I don't need any highfalutin stuff. Just give me the old, old gospel. It thrills my soul. And I, we should never get over it, right? Or ever get used to it. It's just thrilling stuff. And so as we think about it, let's, let's just give a quick overview of Exodus. Chapters 1 through 11, Exodus is the book of redemption. And chapters 1 through 11 is all can be summarized in this phrase, the house of bondage. And it talks about their hard servitude in Egypt. They were slaves. They had a cruel taskmaster, all the rest of it. Chapters 12 through 24, the house of redemption. How God redeemed his people out from their bondage and set them free and delivered them. Right? The house of redemption. And then 25 to 40, the house of God. Because from chapter 25 onwards, if you ever read through Exodus, that's where they start building the tabernacle, which is the house of God. So you've got the house of bondage, the house of redemption, 12 through 24, 25 through 40, the house of God or the tabernacle. So in Exodus 12, this is the historical event of that first Passover. So notice in verse 2. It says, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So it was a time when God's people were redeemed from the bondage of Egypt. They, they were in slavery to their cruel taskmasters. And Egypt is always in the Bible a type of the world, right? The world, this cruel world, the world system. A type of the world. Pharaoh is a type of Satan, the god of this world, small g, right? The, 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 the ruler of the, the, the power of the air and the god of this world, Satan. And this event was so significant that it actually resulted in a change of their calendar. 
He says, this day shall be the, the, the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. In other words, the implication is that it wasn't the beginning of their calendar, but now it is. And they actually literally had two calendars. They had a secular calendar and they had a religious calendar. And this is New Year's Day, as it were, of their religious calendar. Imagine an event so significant that it actually changes the calendars of this world. There was an event significant enough to do that. Remember that? <laughs> it was called Zero AD. Yeah. Christ was born. Yes. Right? But so this is this is a very significant event. It changes your calendar. And isn't it true, in a sense, that when we come to know Christ as our Passover, it also is the, a new beginning for us. Right? The, the day that you were saved, it's kind of, you know, we, we talk about, we have a birthday at the chapel, you know, uh, and uh, uh, have, you know, happy birthday to you. And then they talk about uh, only one will not do, right? Born again means salvation. How many have you? And the other reason we have two birthdays, right? I, I was born July 15th, 1960. I was born again the 16th of June, 1981. That was a new, a completely new world opened up for me. Everything, my whole calendar changed on that day, right? It was, it was life transforming, right? And, and that should be all of us. We might not have a specific day. I realize, especially small children, it's hard for them to have a specific day. But there ought to be a, a recognition that there was a change that took place in your life. A new beginning when you came to know Christ as your Passover. Everything changes with redemption. And this Passover, it literally was Israel's declaration of independence. It really was. It, to them, it meant life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm going to go through that and explain it to you. Remember this, uh, we have certain inalienable, inalienable rights, right? Something like that in the preamble to the Constitution. There you go. It's not bad for an Englishman. I mean, I mean, that I know this stuff, right? I had to do a lot to get my citizenship. I had to do a lot of kind of homework on this stuff, just in case I got these questions. So certain inalienable rights, life, those protected by the blood of the Passover lamb were not slain. It really meant life for them. If you were a firstborn, and your house had no blood on the lintels and the doorposts, you were a dead man. Didn't matter whether you were a Jew or not, right? If you had no blood on your doorpost, you were dead. And so the Passover lamb to you and the application of blood, it meant life to you, real life. You were, you were alive instead of dead. All the firstborn of the lamb died that night. And the only reason you're alive is because of the Passover lamb. By the way, it's interesting. Remember Joshua? As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. You know that Joshua was a firstborn son? Did you know that? He was. If you look at his genealogy, that's why those genealogies are in the book of Chronicles. He was a firstborn. And, and he knows that he should have died that night. And he never got over it. And that's why he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because he knew that he had life. And it was only because of the lamb. Interesting, isn't that? I'm a firstborn, so I appreciate this. I really appreciate this. It means a lot to me. If I'd have been there in the land of, of Egypt, uh, I would have died that night as a firstborn. And so it meant life. It wasn't personal merit, but redemption by blood that saved them. It wasn't that they were nice people. Some of the Egyptians may have been better than them. But what separated them was redemption by blood. It gave them life. It gave them liberty. That night, they were delivered from the bondage of Egypt. It set them free from the shackles of a cruel taskmaster. They were free men that night. They were allowed to go free. And the pursuit of happiness. They began the journey 
to the promised land, the land of Canaan. <clears throat> they began to live different lives. So how did all this happen? How did this new beginning occur for these people? Well, <clears throat> it says that on the 10th day of the month, in verse 3, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the 10th day of the month, this is Exodus 12, verse 3, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So the first thing is the lamb had to be selected. Of course, a lamb signifies to us several things, gentleness, meekness, submissiveness, it, all beautiful pictures of the Lord Jesus. And of course, that, that very famous passage, we're all familiar with Isaiah 53 in verse 7, the Lord Jesus is described in, in that very uh, language. Verse uh, 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a, a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And so we've got the, the meekness, the gentleness, the submissiveness of Christ pictured here in this land. Notice it says in verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. And so it had to have no blemish. Freedom from blemish and injury. It, it, uh, it was to be offered for a sacred purpose. And so it had to be absolutely perfect. And again, it's picturing the Lord Jesus and the moral perfections of the Son of God. He was that only that lamb without any spot or blemish or any such thing. And a spot would refer to something that should not be there, but was there. You ever done that? You got up in the morning and you look in the mirror and all of a sudden you get a big pimple on your cheek or something and it wasn't there the night before and, and you've got a spot and it shouldn't be there and it looks it spoils everything doesn't it don't you want to go out of the house until you get it covered up right yeah. not these vain men but the ladies would be more <laughs> maybe the, the men too i don't know but a spot and then a blemish is something that should be there but is missing and so this lamb it should be it should be all perfectly proportioned everything should be there no spot, no blemish or any such thing. And again, New Testament writers, uh, they verify this is speaking of Christ. First Peter 1 and verse 19, where it says, uh, we're not, verse 18, for as much as you know, you're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So they had to select a lamb, and it had to be without blemish. Notice it says, you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it in the evening. And so next thing is, it, it was selected on the 10th day, and it had to be without blemish, but then it had to be kept to the 14th day before it was killed. And there's several reasons for this. One is, have you ever bought anything at the store and it looked perfect when you bought it? And then when you got it home and you look more closely, you found that it had some defect in it and you had to return it. Okay. So first sight, the lamb looked good. You get it home, you got to observe it carefully. Make sure that it really is without blemish because it has to be a perfect lamb. And of course, we know that the Lord Jesus, as Christ our Passover, he was observed very, very carefully, wasn't he? If ever there was a, a life that was scrutinized, it was the life of the Lord Jesus. Everybody was watching him all the time. And they all came to the same conclusion. But before we get to that, I want to just say this too. What they would do is when they selected this lamb, you know what they do? They keep it in the home. Just like the story, do you remember when David, uh, Nathan came to David to convict him about his sin with Bathsheba? He talked about this pet lamb that was in the house, you see, and grew up with the children kind of thing, right? And, th and that's what the person wanted. And David was indignant. And that's the idea. How, how were they to observe the lamb? They had it in the house. So there was an attachment to the lamb. They, they, they got to, you know, kids got to like it. 
kind of thing, a little bit, because it was around the house. And so there was a connection made, perhaps between the firstborn and the lamb. So the lamb would know, or the, the firstborn would know that that lamb, that it got to know, actually was his substitute, suffered in his place. It was that connection. But it had to be observed. And we think about the Lord Jesus as the lamb scrutinized. God the Father gives us uh, his opinion of the hidden years of the Lord Jesus. You know, we, we don't know much about what happened between 12 years of age. Uh, we, we know about him up to 12 years of age when he, he, he goes up to the Passover. Must, I must be about my father's business, right? We know about that, but we don't know anything until he's 30. Hidden years. All kinds of nonsense written about those hidden years. Scripture is silent. We should be silent. He didn't go to India, uh, or, you know, and meet with gurus and all this kind of stuff, right? None of that nonsense. He was subject to his parents. He worked in the carpenter shop. That's about all we know. But how was he in those years? The, the father breaks the silence of heaven at his baptism. And he says this, this is my beloved son in who I am well pleased. What we know is that whatever the Lord Jesus did in those hidden years, it always pleased the father. Matthew 3, 17. In fact, he could say this without hesitation. I always do those things that please the Father. So even those hidden years, we don't know the details, but we know it was pleasing to the Father. And I would imagine if you got any work that you ordered from that carpenter shop, it would be perfect. Because his eye was always on his Father. And every assignment he was given, he took it as if he was doing it for the Father. By the way, if we would do that too, because we're always being watched too. And so it was God the Father says, I'm well pleased. Men, Pilate <clears throat> says, Luke 23, 14, I find no fault in him. His wife in a dream says to, to Pilate in Matthew's Gospel 27, verse 19, have nothing to do with this righteous man. Interesting. Judas, I have betrayed innocent blood. And then we have the New Testament writers and their kind of summary of the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul, who, you know, I mean, if anybody would have liked to have found the fault, it would have been Saul of Tarsus, right? But he says this concerning the Lord Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he knew no sin. Peter would say, and of course, he had observed him very closely. He'd been with him for three and a half years. If anybody could look at him closely, it would be Peter. And he says, he did no sin. Neither was any guile found in his mouth. See, that's what gives us away, isn't it? Like we can, we can fake it outwardly, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And, and our speech often betrays us. It's what comes out of our mouths that gets into trouble. And yet he says, neither was any guile found in his mouth. No deceit ever came out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. He's perfect. Mm -hmm. Peter says he did, he did not sin. John says, and it's almost like in 1 John 3, verse 5, that previous one, one was 1 Peter 2, 22, he did not sin. 1 John 3, 5, in him is no sin. And it's almost, remember, he said, remember, I had my head on his bosom. I, I had a very close, and I was checking, and I can tell you this, in him, there is no sin. He's perfectly sinless. Amen. The impeccability of the person of Christ. He did no sin. He could not sin. Amen. It was impossible for him to sin. Amen. The sinless son of God, the perfect lamb of God. And in fact, he even challenged his enemies in John 8, 46. And again, they, they, were, they had a vested interest of finding something. So he said, okay, here you go. Take your pot shots. Here it goes. Which of you convinces me of sin? This was their moment. And they, they walked away in stony silence. Because there was never anyone like the Lord Jesus. 
perfect in every way. Mm. Mm. The lamb without spot or blemish or any such thing. And yet, the interesting thing is, the perfect lamb could not save anybody. His perfect life, nobody could go to heaven because the lamb lived a perfect life. Had to die. Now, it had to be perfect in order for that death and the payment that he would make to be a satisfactory payment. He had to be perfect. But his perfect life couldn't save us. The lamb had to be slain. And notice, again, uh, we, we, we see in verse 6 and 7, you shall keep it till the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, this is a very interesting verse. Shall kill it in the evening. Now, let's think about it. Every household had a lamb. So there were probably thousands of lambs that died that night. But God talks about the whole assembly shall kill it. Because in the mind of God, there's only one lamb. Thousands died, but they all represented that one lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth. Mm -hmm. And the whole assembly shall kill it. You see that? Mm -hmm. The whole assembly shall kill it. Because every person, in a sense, is responsible for the death of Christ. Don't say the Jews killed Christ or the Romans killed. No, my sin killed Christ. It was for me that he died on the cross. It was for your sin that he died on the cross. The whole assembly killed him. In a sense, our sin was what caused him to be nailed to that tree. But I don't want to sound radical, but I have to say this, that even the death of the lamb couldn't save them. Because there's one aspect that we haven't talked about. The blood had to be applied. Imagine that they had a perfect lamb, they had selected it, they had kept it, they had killed it, but they didn't bother to apply the blood to the doorposts and the lintel of the house. What would have happened when the death angel came through that night? The first one would have died. Yes. Even though the lamb had died and shed its precious blood, the first one would have died because the blood had not been applied. Yes. See, here's the interesting thing. I don't remember a time ever in my life from having consciousness that I did not understand about Christ dying on the cross. I grew up in a Roman Catholic family. We went to mass from me being a baby. And, and so I knew about Christ's death from very, very young age. And I knew that he died for sin. I knew that. But I never applied it personally till just before my 21st birthday. And if I had died, and I had several opportunities that were close things prior to my 20th birthday, without personally trusting in Jesus as my Savior, I would be in hell today, knowing all about Jesus dying on the cross. And I believed he was perfect. I didn't have any questions about the perfections of Christ. I really did. And I believed that he really died. And I believed that he rose again. I believed all those things, but, but I never applied it to my case. Right? And I was a lost soul. With all this knowledge, I was as lost as lost can be. And it's possible to grow up in an assembly and know all that and be lost unless by faith you believe that it was for you that he died and that his blood was shed. There's got to be that personal application. And so the blood has to be applied. I want you to notice verse 12. It says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt 
this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And so what we could say is that judgment was certain. But God is saying, I'm going through the land of Egypt, and all the firstborn are going to die in the land of Egypt that night. And no doubt about it, because every other plague that's happened, God said, I'm going to send this, and he sent, he sent it, right? So, like, he, we know it, he's absolutely consistent. He said, I'm going to do something, he's going to do it. And so now he says, I'll pass through the land of Egypt this night, I'll smite all the first one. And so judgment was absolutely certain and sure. The only means of escape was applying the blood of the lamb to the doorpost of the house and the firstborn being in. That was the only means of escape. And how did it work? Well, I believe that when the death angel came and saw the blood on the doorpost and the lintels, what the, what the angel of, of death knew was death had already visited that house. It had already taken place. It wasn't the first one that died. It was a perfect substitute that had died instead of the first one. But that was enough. He saw the blood. He said, I'll pass over. Right? No death for that house. Because death has already done its work in the substitute lamb. That's why we can have confidence. I have absolute confidence that I'm going to heaven. Not because I'm a good person. Because I know I'm not. But I have a absolutely marvelous Savior who shed his precious blood mm. for a wretch like me. And I know that I know that I know that I'm going to be in heaven. Not because of anything I ever did. But because of what he did. Oh, what a wonderful truth this is. Yeah. Don't ever get tired of this. This, is, this, is, this should thrill our souls. And it says, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. I'm going to say this one more thing, really, and that is the only basis of assurance is the word of God. Mm. How did the firstborn know he was going to be okay? I mean, just put yourself, sometimes it's good to put yourself in the story for a little while. Just pretend for a minute you're the firstborn. You've witnessed all the other plagues. So you know when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And now he says, I'm going to destroy all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. And you look at your family and you say, okay, that means me. Right? <laughs> that means me. I'm going to die tonight. But then God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And so the firstborn, all he can do is rest in the word of God, right? That's all he can do. He has to rest in it. Now, imagine he's in the house. I want you to imagine now two firstborns in two different houses, okay? One of them simply rests in the word of God. He said, God said, when I see the book, I'll pass over you. So I believe that. And so he's not worried at all. He's not biting his nails. You know, he's not wringing his hands, wondering. He, he's absolutely peaceful because he knows. God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. He's trusting in the word of God. Here's another firstborn. He's in the house as well, different house. And there's blood on the door and the lentils. And he is certainly saved. Because when the, when the angel of death sees the blood, what does he say? Death's already taken place in this house. But he's anxious about it, right? He's biting his nails. He's wondering, did my dad do it right? You know, did he, did he was the lamb completely, you know, was it all perfect? And so he's, he's in bits. He's not really enjoying his salvation, but he's saved nevertheless. He just don't have that assurance that he should have. There are a lot of people today in Christian circles, they're really saved. They, they have trusted Christ, but, but they, they're full of doubts because they don't rest like they should 
on the only assurance you can have, which is the word of God. If you're looking at yourself for assurance, you look in the wrong place because we all fail. The best of men are men at best. And there are going to be days you're going to wonder, am I really saved? Because I, I just said something I shouldn't have said. I did something I shouldn't have done, right? But what are we resting in? What is the basis of assurance? 16th of June, 1981. It dawned on my soul, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I believed on the Lord Jesus that night. And if I was to perish, you know what that would make God out to be? It would make him out to be a liar. But God not only doesn't lie, cannot lie. Amen. It's against his very nature to lie, right? He can't do it. It's impossible for God to lie. And so I'm certain of my eternal destiny. Why? Am I resting on the fact that I'm a preacher? No. <laughs> Couldn't rest on that. I'm resting on the certainty of the word of God. And that's the basis of assurance. And the only safe basis. Because if I base it on my feelings, Luther had it down pat. He said, feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God. Nothing else is worth believing. Because my feelings change. His word doesn't change. It's forever settled in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so it's so good to be able to rest in the Lamb of God. Now, we're kind of going a bit longer. Forgive me, but lunch is not till 1230. So don't worry, you're not going to miss anything. You're not going to be, you're going to be okay. Just got a few more statements to make and then we're done. I want to just talk about this for a moment because I don't know what your thoughts are on this morning and what you've heard. But I hope that it hasn't been dull for you because heaven's going to be a huge disappointment for you if this morning's been dull because heaven is going to be all about the land. Mm -hmm. Scripture yeah. is all about the land. Genesis 22 verse 7, a question is given. Where is the land? Uh, here's the fire. Here's the wood. Where is the land? God will provide himself a lamp, right? There's the answer. When does that lamp come? John 1 29. John the baptizer sees Jesus come towards Jordan. He says, behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Revelation 5 12. The great multitude surrounding the throne and what is there? What is their common agreement? Worthy is the lamb that was slain. See, it's all about the lamb. It's all about the lamb. Mm. That's why we can't get far away from this, because that's what it's all about. Mm. It's the message of the Bible. Mm. Now, one more thing from the passage. Look at verse 3. It says, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So it begins with a lamb. Look at verse 4. Again, this is, might not be in your reading from an inferior translation. It might not have it like this. Verse 4 says, And if the household be too little for the lamb. And then verse 5, Your lamb shall be without blemish. Now I want you to notice that. A lamb, the lamb, your lamb. Isn't that nice? You see, there's a point in our lives where Maybe the Lord Jesus is just a lamb, one among many kind of religious leaders. But then we come to the place where we realize, no, he's not just a lamb. He is the lamb. There's nobody else like him. But that's not enough. It has to come to a point where he's your lamb. So like Paul, you can say, he loved me and gave himself for me because he's my lamb. <laughs> There's that personal element. Isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus is my lamb? Mm. He's the lamb, but he's my lamb. <laughs> he's that lamb that died for me. 
Father, we're so thankful. So eternally grateful for the Lamb of God mm -hmm. and for the wonderful work that he did on Calvary and the perfection of the person who we call the Lamb of God, that there is no spot or blemish or any such thing to be found in him, perfect in all his ways. Father, how thankful we are for his perfect life, for his death that satisfied your demands against sin. And we're thankful for that moment that we personalized the whole thing and the blood was applied to our specific case. And we saw that I was the sinner that Jesus died to save. Oh, Father, how thankful we are for these marvelous, marvelous truths. Mm. But help us never to go tired of hearing this old, old story. And Lord, we pray that we, our, our Lord's suppers, our, our feasts would not degenerate into a going through the motions. Mm. Yes. But, but Father, we ask that the, the fire in our hearts of devotion for the Lord Jesus would burn so brightly that these festivals would be a joy to thy heart once again. And you could see it as, as your feast. <laughs> Something you could feast in, feast in the thoughts that are arising to you from hearts aflame with love concerning the Son who you delight in. Oh Lord, we ask these things for Christ's glory. Amen. Amen.